Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here and returning to the show. This is almost an emergency fashion. Cody Alexander, match quarters, now head of football operation at Field Vision. Occasionally works with Minnesota Vikings cornerbacks, helping them understand the X's and O's better and has been our liaison to understanding football. Cody, great to have you back on the show. We bring you on when things are good. And we bring you on when things are bad. So the nation needs to understand what has happened to the Vikings defense. So I appreciate you coming back on the show, man. How are you? Yeah, great. Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's get into it. Uh, the, the word of the week or last two weeks has been blueprint. Do you believe that the Detroit Lions and Los Angeles Rams have discovered the blueprint for the Minnesota Vikings defense, which was so great over the first five weeks? Well, I think that they've done a little bit different protections uh, and, and, and kind of the run game, the setup. They've been targeting a lot more the Grenard with the running back side, getting way, you know, it's counterintuitive to get, get five out or on early downs, with, meaning that the running back is also going to go out into a pass on early downs against such a pressure heavy team like the Vikings. But what they're doing is instead of going to Van Ginkle's side, they're actually targeting the blitz side or Grenard side, which is typically where that's going to be on the weak side. Now, weak means passing strength away from the passing strength. So teams have started to do that. They've started to slide their protections towards Grenard, which is typically where you're getting those B-gap pressures that were basically hitting everybody uh, early on. So I think what you see is, the to me, what I was worried about with the Lions and then again with the, the Rams is that you put on tape essentially your greatest hits against the Shanahan offense. Now, Ben Johnson is not from the Shanahan tree, but it, it, it's like looking in a mirror with it's with, they do some different things, but it's, uh, it's pretty much the same in terms of motion personnel packages. And then here you have Sean McVay, who we know when he has both of his top receivers, he has a running back who can actually run the ball you now are looking at a just an absolute monster and giving him then, hey, I've got four weeks of a game plan on how to attack you. So that was what my big worry was on a short week, that knowing that McVay doesn't have to work as hard as the, the Vikings did in that game. Yeah, for sure. Now, a couple of things kept cropping up between uh, both of the games, and, and one of them was just the middle of the field. Uh, now, they're missing Blake Cashman over those last two games. Not sure if he's going to be back this week, uh, but within the next couple weeks, he will definitely return. I thought that that was the biggest factor for what Detroit and Los Angeles were able to take advantage of because he covers a lot of ground. He often succeeds on his blitzes, but also he's doing a lot of the stuff at the line of scrimmage making changes, reading the offense. Can you explain what that role is and why it would be missed so much when Blake Cashman is out? Yeah, so we're actually, it's interesting. The other defense that's probably closely related in terms of structure and what they're trying to do to the Vikings is actually the Buccaneers. And the Buccaneers have had some linebacker issues. And then we're seeing like the, the two games against Atlanta, Kyle Pitts goes off. Like Kyle Pitts actually is a football player. Well, he's finally showing up. But again, you give Kirk Cousins an opportunity to throw right in front of his face. He's going to be one of the more accurate quarterbacks in the NFL. He, we, we know that. And so what? How, how does that translate back to what the Vikings are doing? Well, you are running a lot of five-man pressures, meaning that you don't have that seventh man in, the protect, in, in coverage. That guy tends to be that middle hole player. And so there is a void. So if you don't hit on that pressure – that void is there. And what have the Lions and the Rams been able to take advantage of? Digs and over routes right there in that middle. They're being able to hold, let that receiver get in between the linebacker and the safety, and then they're hitting that guy right in the middle. And really just the sweet spot of the defense, especially when you're playing split field coverage behind five-man pressures. Right, and with Ivan Pace Jr., it seemed like they almost turned him into just a fifth defensive lineman with the amount that he was pressuring and asked Josh Metellus, to cover the middle of the field. And I just don't think that scared either team. It seemed like the lions were perfectly fine with running, you know, in routes right behind Josh Metellus and just kind of throwing it over him. I, I think he's a really good player, but it's not the same as the, the type of 
a ground that Blake Cashman covers. And we see the recklessness that Blake Cashman plays with in, in a really good way, like diving and deflecting passes. I think he's also from that spot, really good at reading route combinations behind him. And there were plays where I thought Metellus maybe didn't get enough depth, didn't understand kind of where that guy was going to be. And that's something that Cashman would have done. The other thing too, is on the outsides, uh, both teams took advantage of swing passes, bubble screens, things like that. It, it, is there a solution to that from what we saw? Because Cooper Cup was getting the ball that way, Puka Nakua, Jameer Gibbs, and they ripped off some pretty big gains by just throwing it to the flat and letting those guys run. Yeah, and so what ends up happening is what these offenses, especially the Lions and the Rams, did is they got in base sets, just a set that you would draw up on the whiteboard if you were talking ball, right? Like there's nothing fancy about it. They just get in a regular set. It's soft coverage, and they they have taken advantage of the two starting corners unwillingness to be physical and tackle and that's essentially once the perimeter screens last year was kind of the answer early for the all-out blitzes that we saw but you had corners that were willing to get into get down and get in there you know the safeties were also triggering fast and with these five-man pressures instead of like the all-out stuff they're not anchored anymore so they're playing a little bit more passive in coverage so they're going to be a little less likely to just trigger hard down on it because if they, they there's not an extra man that's going to be hitting that blitz. So the, the quarterback has to get it out. So what's happening is these perimeter screens, as teams have kind of figured out, hey, we can block these corners and then we just have to win the one-on-one -on -one versus the safety. And so I think that that's really where we are. You know, you go and you look, the perimeter screens have really hurt them. The access throws, uh, I thought the the Rams did a really good job of just having Puka Nakua, who, by the way, is a is a large – I mean, he's not small. He's 6'2", 217. Cooper Cup is around 6'1", 205, 210. These are not tiny receivers. And so they're just catching the ball. There's a tackle coming out that the corner has to deal with with and they're doing some sort of motion away from it to get the coverage rotation the other way and so then they're just throwing it back to an access throw because let's be honest the vikings don't press uh and they don't play man coverage and so teams have kind of figured that out and how do you attack how do you attack soft zone you throw those free access throws to your bigger receivers let them be a running back Right, right. And it was very clear that uh, Puka Nakua was uh, at least close enough to 100% health to run over a bunch of Vikings uh, defensive backs. A as we go through the different things that have kind of worked here, I, I also thought that uh, playing with some tempo worked for both teams. Getting up to the line of scrimmage quick, not allowing the Vikings to make any real changes there, and then just running their plays pretty quickly do the Vikings have to deceive the opposing team in order to succeed? Because that's what I started to think over these last two games. I also thought, as you mentioned, Puka Nakua, that personnel matters here. Both these teams have great receivers and great weapons. I mean, Jameer Gibbs is almost a wide receiver. Amon Ross St. Brown is a good, as good as it gets for yards after catch, playing out of the slot. And then Nakua and Cooper Cup, if they're healthy the rest of the year, I wouldn't be surprised if the Rams make the playoffs. Most teams can't do that to them, uh, but I still think that the tempo thing is something that they can do because the Vikings can't get kind of the last check or the last change and, and switch things up after they've read how the protection is getting changed if the opposing team is coming right to the line of scrimmage and then just running their play within the first 10 seconds of the uh, the clock. Well, it's just become too predictable, kind of like what we saw last year of, okay, we know we're going to get the all up on first down. If we win that and we get you in the late down, we're going to drop eight and play Tampa two. And we're just, the only difference is we're going to disguise the coverage. It's going to be some weird rotation every week. Um, and then we're going to throw in maybe a cover three in there just to, to keep you on your toes. Uh, I think that that's where we've gotten. And, and that's the problem with success is that a lot of times you get survival bias within a staff. And I'm not saying that they, and I think they do a good job of trying to be different, trying to do some different things. But I think in these past two weeks, especially on a short week, you didn't have time to really adjust. The lions are very physical. There's a real, there is a real thing called the the Detroit hangover. Um, but I do think that there are things that they can do 
in sell scouting and just changing the way that they are doing some certain things. They have started to run a little bit more man coverage on some third and mediums where they want to play some tight coverage. Um, it just hasn't necessarily panned out successfully, um, but they are trying to do some different things. You know, one of the problems that they've had before is that they always hit that weak side B gap with pressure. And being able to then not necessarily always do that, have a strong side rotation to it or a blitz off of that, trying to maybe change up some of the coverage looks off of it. Uh, those are going to be things that are going to be critical going forward. So I would be I would be shocked if after the bye week that we don't have a little bit of change, even if it's just a shuffling of who's playing or just some sort of an add on to the, the plays that we're already seeing. But great point about tempo. You can't when you can't get the last check, you gotta have a menu. You can't just go back to the things that you've always been doing. Hang on, let me silence my phone real quick so I can tell you that us days at US Cellular is back again. Exclusive offers just for customers, just to say thanks. Right now, you'll get twelve hundred dollars off any phone plus four hundred dollars off any tablet. Amazing, right? But my family is so excited about their new devices, they keep texting me during the show. They're all about us days deals like $1,200 off any phone, $400 off any tablet. Terms apply. Visit uscellular.com for details. Well, and the that was the really the problem that you mentioned with uh, the adjustments that they're going to be able to make with a Thursday night game. You can't do that. And I think that was a very clear advantage where Sean McVay on his side could say, oh, I have a lot of that stuff. Let's just do this stuff. We already have that because the Lions and the Rams do some similar things, uh, but the Vikings could not say, oh, actually, we're going to have to make some big adjustment. I think they had maybe one practice in between right. Thursday. Yes. And and if, if the game had been on a Sunday, maybe it would have been a little different. I, I still think some of these weaknesses, and, and that's what I want to parse through with you, is solutions and also which one of them are unsolvable with the current personnel? Because it's a big discussion here. How much should they try to go out in the trade market and make some sort of addition? Um, so do you think that without the addition of different players, that the issues that they had the last two weeks, how many of them are fixable or adjustable for a defensive coordinator? Well, the one that's fixable is you probably could go out and get a, get a corner. And now I know if you're sitting there and you're like, wait a second, we we went out and we got Gilmore, we went out and we got Shaquille Griffin. The problem that we're finding right now is that they can't play man coverage, which it, we, these zone pressures are great when they're hitting because you have vision, you're getting the ball thrown low in the zone, meaning that it's getting thrown towards the line of scrimmage, and then you're attacking it. Uh, the problem that we're finding right now is that teams have kind of figured out the protection scheme part of it. They kind of have an idea that it's probably going to be Ivan Pace or, oh, Van Ginkle. It's kind of the old uh, what uh, Quinn was doing with Micah Parsons last year. Like, hey, you want to play off-ball linebacker? Sure, we'll put you in off-ball, but then we're going to put you to the B-gap. And then that's what we get with, with kind of Van Ginkle. That was the adjustment. Uh, in in the Rams game was, well, we'll just play Van Ginkle off ball as kind of an off ball linebacker because we, we only have pace and then we're just going to blitz him. So that was kind of the adjustment. I think that comes with health with the linebacker. But in terms of what can I do right now, probably go and get a corner so that you can start playing a little bit more man coverage. That is something that Griffin kind of had, was good at, at least when he was with the Panthers. He's shown he's been okay. Um, I think in man coverage, struggles a little bit in in these zone coverages. Sometimes his eye, he likes that eye candy low in the zone, doesn't necessarily sink. But that would be one I can fix. Now, one you can't fix is interior pass rush. You're going to have to wait till free agency for that, or you're going to have to draft somebody. Uh, those guys are not being traded. Uh, those guys are those are legacy guys. You get an alien inside, you don't let them. And if you get two of them, you def, you just pay them and you figure it out. You you know that those are guys that you don't get rid of. So that's one you can fix, and and one you can't fix uh, right now. Right. No, you're exactly right. And uh, every Viking fan in the world wants Dexter Lawrence or uh, Jeffrey Simmons. And that's what we keep, like, hey, if they're available, then absolutely yes. you spend that first round pick. But you're right. I mean, when you go through the league's guys at that spot, the Kenny Clark, the Grady Jarrett, they just they're just with their teams for their whole life because they're so hard to find. And also the Vikings have been struggling to find that guy for the last five years since Sheldon Richardson left. Uh, that they have not had someone who can create that interior pressure. I also think that 
there is a form of defensive tackle who kind of only does that. Like that's his job. He comes in and he just rushes up the middle. The Vikings don't really have it. They kind of looked for Jerry Tillery to maybe add some of that as a cheap free agent addition. And I actually think he's been okay, yeah. but there's no, uh, they used to have Tom Johnson. He was the guy who came in and I would talk about him all the time. And fans would kind of make fun of me for how much I talked about him. It's like, this guy's hard to find this rotational, like undersized gets after the quarterback type of player and it's the the freak aliens are impossible to get which may be an argument for trying to keep their first round pick rather than trading it at the right. deadline because you want to try to draft those defensive tackles and i think it was uh, our friend brad spielberger formerly of pff who pointed out that all of the top guys who are paid at defensive tackle are all first or second round draft picks so normally yes you have to get those guys as far as trading for a corner though I mean, corner is not a position that people are just giving away either. Do you have an idea? Do you have a thought, an option that they could potentially go out and bring somebody in? Because I agree with you. And I think still losing Makai Blackman in the off season to the injury is something that didn't really crop up right away, but is now starting to show its face. Yeah, I think there's two names that you could probably look at and two teams that might be willing to just start going on a fire sale, and that's the Browns and the Jets. Um, I think you got to ask maybe for Denzel Ward, maybe even Newsom, somebody like that to come over. Uh, Ward plays outside, so that's probably who you want to try and see if you can't get. I do think in, in another team, the Jets, both of these teams also have a plethora of corners that they could move on. Low. So even though they move away from Ward, you have a guy behind him that can probably play play that they don't feel like we're just, you know, we're going to sink even lower. Now they're, they're in huge trouble, just cap situation. So they may just try and get rid of everybody that has money and just kind of eat it for next year. Now the jets have really Eccles is the guy. Now the, the pipe dream would be to get DJ Reed. Uh, because they do have Eccles behind him. But Eccles has really come on this year. It's a system that's very similar to what I think the Vikings want to run, which is quarters with cover one as a changeup. Now, if you're sitting here and you're like, yeah, the Vikings don't run cover one. they I think they want to. They just can't right now. And I think that that's kind of one of those things that if you can get at least one guy that can be that travel guy, lockdown guy, and then you have these savvy safeties that can kind of either play a double or they can play in the middle of the field, especially like Harrison Smith, just kind of sit there as a robber, let Bynum kind of work as a post safety. And then you can kind of mitigate a lot of the issues off of that. So it, those are two guys who I would be right now banging on the door to say, hey, what can we do? Because you know you need a premium corner for the Vikings you know you can't get a premium interior defensive lineman so the, that would be the the avenue that I would go for a quick fix to try and like hold on to this this playoff ride I enjoy watching DJ Reed so much I will drive to New York to pick him up or New Jersey and drive him back to Minnesota when he played against the Vikings going back and watching that on tape one of the most physical and instinctual corners that you're ever going to find. I don't I don't know, even know what the Jets are doing because their general manager has to be fired after this year. So is he going to say, oh, yeah, well, let me sell off parts and plan for the future? Well, that man might not have a future. Right. Uh, I think Cleveland actually might think that after beating Baltimore and we saw the Vikings in that same position a couple of years ago not sell things off because they were like, oh, we got a big win and now we're going to try to chase the playoffs. Uh, but Denzel Ward would be a good option there too. It's even the even if you went a notch down from those guys and looked for someone who was just a player that they could rotate in for a fifth round draft pick because their trust for a Caleb Evans is clearly zero. They brought in Fabian Morrow, who's been around for a long time, but don't seem to want to play him either. And he didn't look very good in training camp. There's just nobody behind these guys. And I think when you're asking older corners because Shaq Griffin is an older corner. He's a bigger corner. And the same thing with Stefan Gilmore. When you're asking them to play every single snap of every single game, eventually they're going to get worn down. I think that's what happened last year with a lot of the players on defense. I think that's what's happening this year. But I also, Cody, don't want to act like the sky has fallen on yeah. this defense. They played if you were to do an all offensive coordinator draft, you're probably picking Ben Johnson and Sean McVay in the top three. So what should our, our concern level be here as they go forward to play Indianapolis, Jacksonville, Tennessee, teams that do not have the best of the best for quarterbacks and coordinators? 
Yeah, I think if we look back in a month, let's say we're at the end of November, we look back in the month and we've gone two and two or one of that three. I mean, I, I think that we, there, we need to say, OK, something's obviously not working. This is two years in a row. Um, there is going to be a regression. I think people forget they don't want to they, look. Are the best coaches always in the NFL? No, but. I do think that there's a reason why when you are a professional at what you do in a game where everybody, the millions and millions, billions of dollars are on the line, the stress level, not only that, but like the, you know, genius of desperation to steal from my friend, Doug Farrar, uh, you figure it out quick. Um, and I think Andy Schatz, who does um, DVOA, he's the one that kind of invented DVOA. He had a tweet the other day I thought was really interesting. He said teams that start as hot as the Vikings do typically regress. Uh, so at some point, teams were going to get it figured out. And when you play that many quality offensive coordinators in a row, those guys all, they, they may not talk during the year, but they all are paying attention to each other. That's a whole family that you just went, down the gauntlet with and you ended with the probably the best two in that uh at the end of that gauntlet so i think if you go three and one in the next four games we're fine uh, four and oh, the four and oh is even a possibility there as well i think that you start going two and two one and three i think that there you, you might need to start reevaluating kind of what what are we doing on defense it's getting figured out early in down you know early in in the season like or midpoint of the season and here we are you know fighting for the playoffs instead of holding that playoff spot throughout the whole entire year yeah, I think that's a it's a very good litmus test these next couple of weeks because you should just get back yes. to being yourself, especially with a game on Sunday Night Football at U.S. Bank Stadium against the quarterback who is lost out there uh, in Anthony Richardson. And you know what? Uh, 20 minutes into the pod, I, I got a little tired. I'm just going to tap my head here, go to the sideline. I'll be right back. Somebody else <laughs> is going to fill in for a question or yes. two. Now I'll come back. I've never seen that before. Nah. So it clearly Anthony Richardson is not even a professional quarterback yet the way that he's playing. And th that could also be a solution as opposed to facing Jared Goff and Matthew Stafford. Again, all quarterback draft. You're picking those guys pretty, pretty high up. Um, if you were to win a one game, I, I am curious about the other parts, some of the other parts of personnel that I want to ask you about. And one of them is uh, the edge rushers and what they've done there with Andrew Van Ginkle, but also not using Dallas Turner. Uh, I'm surprised that Patrick Jones is on the field a lot more than Dallas Turner. And part of the explanation for why Dallas Turner hasn't played more has been that he's a rookie and he's still trying to learn what they're doing. It, do you think that that's it? I mean, is it complicated for edge rushers as well? Because I, I mean, I know it is for linebackers. I know it is for corners and safeties, but what about that position? Um, I, I really think that it's more or less Flores has shown pretty much his, the past several years, his affinity for one, not subbing you're, he's kind of an all 11 defensive coach. There are a little bit, maybe you bring in, I know Griffin has earned some playing time and when they want to move Murphy inside with a nickel, Metellus obviously is not playing a lot of deep safety, but he is playing a lot of that big nickel or uh, kind of that that money backer position when they go kind of he lines up with pace. That's part of Cashman being hurt. But you can kind of tell there's about 12 to 13 guys that he really wants to play. And that's typically who he plays. I think that that's the fine line uh, you in coaching. You have to have kind of that fine line of, of when do you play a young player? And then when when is that player just lost? I guarantee you there are certain things that, that Turner can do. We saw that early in the season. I mean, he can rush the passer. I would also argue, too, that he came from one of the most complex systems, probably more complex than most NFL systems uh, from Alabama, and he moved around. They didn't just keep him as, like, rush end um, and just kind of say it, he wasn't like a, a, a dog, right? Like, go get the quarterback guy. Like, that wasn't what he did. Like, he moved around. Um, I will say this uh, with him, you against Georgia, the one concern I had with him is that, you know, they found ways to kind of get him off the off the ball uh, or off the off the field when they went 12 personnel, run, you know, fitting the run from an edge. So maybe that's the deal. He's not playing on early downs. And, then, and again, 
Flores isn't a big package guy. They're they're doing different personnel groupings, but it's not like each week you kind of have a flavor of the week. We're going to have like a, a a cheetah package where we get all our fast guys on the field and we're going to go blitz the we're going to go just blitz the quarterback on third down. In fact, they have some of the lowest blitz rates on third down. Hmm. Um, so I think that it you have to find as a coach especially after the bye week when you've kind of put hit pause, let's get, let's get going. You've got to sit back and you've got to look and say, okay, where are opportunities for us to get him on the field to have a little bit of success? Because success is going to breed that involvement, that growth. That's what's going to happen. So I think to me, it's, that's, if there's one knock on Flores, it's probably that he leans probably too much into the veterans um, and not getting these young guys a little bit more playing time, is, even in situations where, uh, you know, maybe we don't want to because the game's close. But there have been plenty, plenty of times, opportunities at the beginning of the year to get some of these guys some reps. And, I, and like I think you, you mentioned it, like his reps have slowly kind of dwindled to where he's not really playing that much now. Um, but that would be what I would look for kind of going forward. You got to find ways to get these guys on the field. Yeah, I think that most of the time I've been willing to be patient there. And he was getting something like 15 to 20 snaps early in the season. But in this last game, Patrick Jones is playing 40 snaps and gets zero pressures and Dallas Turner plays three snaps. And that just doesn't compute for me. And it's hard to critique Brian Flores because he's had so much success. The defense is still extremely good. I think an expected points added their third in the NFL. Right. So it's like, well, you know what's going on in practice. You know better what Dallas Turner knows than I do. But the gap of 46 snaps for a player who's largely been ineffective during his career outside of a hot run of a couple sacks early in the season versus somebody with Dallas Turner's quickness and ability to get after the passer and the few snaps you have seen the acceleration from him, the athleticism from him. But I think that part of it is he gets washed out easily. So yeah. I'm thinking about like a Yannick Ngakwe, how he would get 10 sacks, but his pressure rate wouldn't be that high where if it doesn't work, he's kind of a non-factor. It's not like a push the pocket type of guy. And there were a couple plays in the lions game where they tried to put him at linebacker and the guard got out to him and it was just kind of over. That's a thing where he needs to get bigger. He needs way more experience. He's one of the youngest players in the entire league, right. which matters. But I also think third down, he should be in every single time. I just don't know any reason why he wouldn't be on the field there. Yeah, and I agree. I think that that's kind of the thing that, again, if there if there's one knock on Flores, it's probably that the young guys don't play enough. Um, you've got to and, – and I think when you think about it, you only have a 53-man roster – there's only like not even 50 of them even get to like get to suit out. So it's just you have very limited guys. If you're going to travel them, you should try and you should try and find a way, especially if they're going to be a part of the organization going forward or you have a plan for them. I mean, they moved off Andrew Booth. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not like they're not they haven't shown a willingness to if a guy's done and he's not going to play. Let's not waste. Let's not waste any more times. They've shown that. So it just would to me would be. um you know, that would be something I think that, like you said, find ways to get some of these guys, especially a first round draft pick that, you know, you've going to, you've already sunk some money into, let's find a way to get them on the field. Right. I think patience also from fans, knowing yes. that Flores is not someone to throw a guy right out there. And at that edge rusher spot in the NFL, there's so many guys who had three or four sacks their first year and every one of their fan bases went, did we spend too much of a draft pick on Khalil Mack? who had four sacks in his first season. Trey Hendrickson, I think, had two and was a very high draft pick. And then those guys eventually uh, emerged and became very good. One other uh, position I want to ask you about is the safety spot. They've got a decision to make about extending Cam Bynum and also Harrison Smith coming back this year and Flores playing him every single snap, which is kind of... I'm to the age where the hairline is moving back, but it's making it move back even more with my worry about playing players too much because we've seen them just get tired out over the season. I wonder if you think that's sort of two part question, if they should try to extend Cam Bynum or if that's a position in this defense that you can easily replace and just where Harrison Smith stands in this defense right now. Yeah, I think I think with the Bynum thing, I think you probably do extend him. Um, it's in, unless you have a plan or unless you feel like somebody's going to come open in free agency. We did have a weird 
free agency where some of these older guys got released. Um, but it's very rare unless, uh, you know, for the, like the Packers, for instance, it's very rare to get an Xavier McKinney at 25 released. But the Giants have shown that if they don't pay safeties, their second contract, Julian loves another one who's having a really good year for another team that's uh, was originally drafted by the Giants. So, you know, th- guys like that or guy, a guy like Jesse Bates, who uh, the Bengals, I guarantee you, are wishing that they would have uh, kept him. Um, that Those guys are rare. Uh, and when they do come available, you really got you, you probably need to go and spend the capital on on them for that. Um, but I think Bynum is, is more than serviceable. He's done a good job with him. I know that there's been some bust over the past couple of years, but finding a quality guy at that position, you're not going to overpay for him. Um, and so, two, you, are you going to draft another guy? I know they like uh, the Theo Jackson um, guy, but again, he's not playing as much as that you probably would like because Smith, I mean, like you said, they're just kind of letting these older guys really just ride it out. Like, Hey, we're just going to let you play. And if you get a bum, bum knee, bum ankle, like bum hip, we'll figure it out. Like we'll, uh, we'll just go to the next man up. Um, but you know, that's the thing probably next year. If I'm, if I'm looking at this team, we got to find a corner. We got to find an interior defensive lineman, at least a quick three, somebody that can rush the passer. You don't, I think you have two guys that are, you know, it, it, Harrison is, uh, Phillips is uh, just, he's a, the prototypical nose. I mean, that's who you want at nose. I mean, he's, he's going to plug it. He's a, a workhorse. He's great against the run. He's just kind of a, a menace that offensive linemen don't want, you know, they have to double team them, but you have to find a quick three. You got to find a corner and then you, you need to have some sort of a, um, a stop gap for that Harrison with Harrison Smith, probably not coming back next year. That is three technique defensive tackle. Yes. Football. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I agree with you on Bynum. I think he's been very good the last two years. I just, you mentioned Theo Jackson. He had a great training camp. He played well in fill in duty for them last year, a high IQ player. Everybody thinks can play. And he has, I think 20 snaps this year. I I just, that's where I I need to see Flores make some adjustments. I think maybe just as big as any of the schematic stuff is get Theo Jackson on the field, get another cornerback that they can trust on the field to give, uh, you know, a break to Stefan Gilmore and maybe uh, that helps a lot. What what should I know about uh, the Indianapolis Colts defense as the Vikings get prepared to play them? Probably the most simplest defense you're going to see. I mean, uh, Gus Bradley's notorious for being a 4-3, cover-3 guy. He has run a little bit more cover-2 this year, which is basically a Tampa, which on a whiteboard, it looks just like cover three. It's just a little different. You have hard corners instead of soft corners. Um, but they really like their front line, uh, the getting pressure. Um, but that's, to me, it's going to be a lot of the same things. Their corners have played relatively well when they do play man, they don't play man very much. So you're going to see a lot of cover three. Um, you're going to see a lot of four man rush, not a lot of pressures. If it is third and long or a third, they, he wants to get after, you might see some six man pressures, but not pressure heavy, nothing fancy. They just go out and they play football. Yeah. And uh, I saw DeForest Buckner is uh, back, which is very disturbing. I think for yeah. the Minnesota Vikings, because the last time he played against the Vikings, he picked up a man who weighed 320 pounds and threw him at Kirk Cousins back in, in uh, 2020. That was one of those, the whole internet sees you get run over by a defensive tackle. That was the last time. Um, not necessarily ideal for the Vikings who are now missing their left tackle as yes. well and scrambling a little bit uh, on the defensive line. So you uh, and the Field Vision Project are new this year. Uh, so people probably who have listened to the show for a long time know about Match Quarters, your Substack, matchquarters.com. Extremely in-depth defensive analysis that I love. But uh, tell everybody about Field Vision. Yeah, so Field Vision is a company that we started this offseason. It's a predictive analytics company, so we're trying to do uh, some machine learning and predictive kind of looking at the NFL. Uh, obviously, you can use it for betting or fantasy, kind of working through that model through this year. And then it's completely free, so if you look up Field Vision on your phone, you can download the app and take a look at it. Uh, but what we also are is a data company and being able to create some really cool visuals for data. So if you're a data head or 
or a stats nerd and not just like how many passing yards do they have. We also have advanced analytics like EPA. Uh, we came up with a proprietary uh, rating system that we think is even better than PFS because it actually is about what the player is doing when they're targeted or when they're actually in the game. Uh, and then you going against obviously historical data and giving them an actual grade for uh, what that game was. And then obviously that season and building off of that, because we've used again, machine learning to find out what actually like an interception is actually worth and where it's worth on the field. And we can actually do that through AI and machine learning. So it's really cool. Uh, obviously like people think of the betting and, and the fantasy on the front end, but we are also a data company doing some really, really cool things. So make sure to check that out. And again, it's completely free. Just go to field vision on your phone and download the app. Yeah, I have uh, toyed around with it quite a bit. A lot of interesting data there. Not that there would be any nerds who listen to this show <laughs> or do the show. Uh, not here, uh, but it, no, very, very cool uh, project. And I've enjoyed following the development of that throughout this offseason and now seeing it in place uh, this season. So Cody Alexander, Match Quarters, I appreciate this. Uh, this this took us inside the game of what is going on with the Vikings defense. And maybe bottom line is it's not going to be perfect. And you'll probably have to score some points to win some football games someday. Um, but it's also not as bad as it just looked. Right. Yeah, 100%. It's never as bad. And it's never as good as you think. <laughs> exactly. Thanks again, Cody. Great to catch up with you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you.